Okay, you guys, um, I, you have no idea. I am so excited about the starting run of us going through Mosaic and, and taking you guys through some concepts that are really, you're going you're gonna to hear me go down a road um, talking about an issue, and I, I'm going to challenge you over these next two months, when I'm preaching on one piece, don't, don't sit there and go, well, hang on, I know there's more to it than that, and da 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 No. Stick with the whole picture so you can gain an understanding. After tonight, you will completely understand. Um, but I'm going to hit three different areas tonight, for example, that it's so crazy that religions actually take one of these three areas and cling to it and act like the other two are pointless. But it's reality. It's the reality. In fact, it's so much of the reality. Back in the 1600s and 1700s, back in the day where denominations took off, this is why. They would even take some of the concepts we're going to talk about tonight, and they would take one piece, somebody else would take another piece, and they would have these huge, massive debates, and poof, now we have a new denomination. Poof, now we have a new one. Poof, now we have a new one. Left and right. Instead of taking the Bible as a whole. Because see, the concept of a mosaic is when you actually have pieces that are all kind of coming together, and they end up forming a picture. Okay? And I want to take this mosaic. It's a mosaic, actually, of one of Van Gogh's paintings, very famous painting. It's Starry Night. And it's a bunch of pieces that were put together. Okay? But a lot of times, if you look at it, and you only see the top part right up here, the Starry Night, people think, oh, that's such a peaceful time. Some people look at the village part and they go, oh, what a sweet little village. You got to take the whole picture. Because one thing in the picture that so many miss is this structure right here. It's the church. It's a starry night. Little houses everywhere with some light on. And you'll notice there's only one place with no light. And that's the church. And the reason why is Van Gogh actually was doing ministry things when he was younger. He was following after the path of his father. And he was actually involved in ministry. But as he began to see the poor and the needy, and there's a lot of biography that you can read about him, and some kind of go back and forth, but really there's a consistency here. As he was getting into the poor and needy, the church began to say, we don't do that, and put him down. His conflict was not with God. His conflict became with the body. And I wonder... How much work? Everybody knows that Van Gogh kind of lost his mind later on in life because he did kind of tripped out a little bit. Um, I wonder how much artwork Van Gogh could have done for the cause in the name of Jesus Christ if the church had allowed him to minister to the poor and the needy. Well, like Jesus said that we are to do anyway. Hello? But you got to take the whole picture. And there's so many things in this that you can see But you miss because you look at one part or another. It's almost like when you read your Bible, though. True story. Billy Graham preached on John 3.16. John 3.16, the most common, familiar verse ever, okay, that everybody and their dog seems to know, okay, and I'm sure there's a dog out there that can bark it out, okay, but everybody and their dog seems to know John 3.16. He preached on this one time straight for a month every day. Preached on John 3.16 and had different points to come out every day. John 3.16. Powerful. But how many of y'all, you've read the word of God, and as you've read the word of God, you've opened it up to certain parts, and you're like, I've read that before, but wow, I must have missed that somewhere. You know what I'm saying? This summer, I went through the book of Luke. Summer going into fall. And man, I've read Luke. I've taught on Luke. But I started going back through it. And wow, there are so many things that I'm like, who put that in there? I've read this before, but y'all know what I'm talking about, right? Well, that's what's going on right here, and that's what we're going to talk about. We're going to talk about different principles and different things, and tonight we're actually talking about something, and you're going to catch me be kind of devil's advocate. That's why I said, hang on. I'm going to hit one issue, and I'm going to act like that is the issue. Nothing else matters. So stay with me till the end, guys. All right? 
Because one issue about Christianity, this is the freedom opener, where you guys are supposed to be challenged to where you can go out and witness to your friends. Anybody that hears this, you are, I mean, that's, that's our job. In theory, that's what freedom is about, is to go out and witness to our friends and bring friends in. Okay? Well, we're going to start off by actually saying you can't do anything about it. For somebody to come to Christ, it is absolutely their personal responsibility. Because look at Romans 10, 9, and 10. Okay, Romans 10, 9, and 10 says, if you confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you, who? You will be saved. For it's with your heart that you believe and are justified, and it's with your mouth that you believe and are saved. You, you, you must believe. You must confess. I cannot look at you and say, Amber, hey, so glad you're here, so glad you're back, um, you have to believe this and make you believe it. Now, you can look at me and go, okay, David. But that doesn't mean you believe it, right? That's like when some science teacher is teaching you about evolution. And you're like, all right. And I know what I need to answer on my test for your stupid class. But baby, I know the truth, and I know what evolution really is about. But whatever. It's kind of the same principle here. No one can make you believe anything. They can try to convince you, but we can't make you believe it because it's up to you. In fact, it's so far up to you that Jesus actually comes out in Luke, and he brings up this little story about how three different people come to him. And I want you to read how this goes in Luke chapter 9, starting with verse 57. As they were walking along the road, a man said to him, I'll follow you wherever you go. Jesus replied, foxes have holes and birds of the air have nests. But the Son of Man has no place to lay his head. He said to another man, hey, follow me. But the man replied, well, first, let me go and bury my father. Jesus said to him, let the dead bury their own dead. But you go and proclaim the kingdom of God. Still another said, I will follow you, Lord. But first, let me go back and say goodbye to my family. Jesus replied, no one who puts his hand to the plow and looks back is fit for the service in the kingdom of God. You guys, they're all coming up with excuses. I'm going to refer back to the message because the message, as we all know, it's just a paraphrase. But I'm going to refer back to that paraphrase because it kind of, kind of makes some of this make a little bit easier sense, and then I'll land it. So in the message, he goes, on the road, someone asked if he could go along. Hey, can I go? I'll go with you wherever, he said. Jesus was curt, meaning he was pretty straight. He was pretty blunt. This is the way it is. Uh, are you ready to rough it? We're not staying in the best ends, you know. Jesus said to another, hey, follow me. And he said, certainly, but... If you'll first excuse me for a couple of days, please, I have to go make arrangements for my father's funeral. I love this. Jesus refused. First things first, your business is life, not death. And life is urgent. And now it's God's kingdom. Then another said, I'm ready to follow you, master, but first excuse me while I get things straightened out at home. Jesus said, "Uh uh-uh, no procrastination, no backward looks. You can't put God's kingdom off till tomorrow. Seize the day. Here's the thing, okay? There's so many ways that people interpret those three things, but really, when push comes to shove, this is what it's about. Jesus said all three of those people, and he says, look, you either want to come with me now or you don't. You either want to come, follow me, take up the road that I'm going to travel, walk with me, be my disciple, go forward, speak life, don't worry about death, announce God's kingdom, or you don't. And guess what? You can't make me do that. True story? You can't. And some people act like they have that kind of power, and they think they have that kind of power. They may have some kind of clones and robots and wannabes that are following them for a while, but if they don't really have their heart in it, does it really matter? Does it matter? And we know that, right? We know that. Even look at Luke 9, 23, another very, very familiar verse. Jesus is talking about the cost of being a disciple, and what he says is, If anyone would come after me, he must deny himself, take up his cross daily, and follow me. And Jeremiah, I could want you to come to Christ so bad that you know what? Whatever your burdens are, I'll just carry them all for you. I'll do it for you. I'll carry the cross that Jesus wants you to bear. I'll just carry it for you. His cross wasn't meant for me. You follow? Must deny himself. Take up his own cross and follow me. And you guys, 
There's a lot of people that preach that, and guess what? It's true. Do you know that? That is 100% true. No one can make anybody else believe. So honestly, when it comes to Christianity, there's a total personal responsibility. They want it or they don't. When you're looking at the friends in your little school place or in your workplace or around your neighborhoods or whatever, and you're looking at them and you're thinking, you know, they're either going to want to come to Christ or they're not. It's up to them. Guess what? You're right. It is absolutely on them to make that decision and make that choice. And nothing you can do can make them make that decision. And you need to understand that. Because you have power, ultimate power, over nobody. I always love them when somebody looks at me and they say, you know, they all, this little group gets in trouble. And then somebody goes, well, they started it. <laughs> okay. Are you their puppet? Are you their little dummy and they just kind of open your mouth and prop for you? You know, hey, ah. no. It's your choice. I don't care if they did something. You chose to do it. You chose to follow suit. You know what I'm saying? And you guys know as well as I know. Because we all say that same stupid line. You hear it, you know, you follow the crowd, and all of a sudden somebody like a parent looks at you, and you're like, I just want to smack my parent when they say this, you know? You you look at, the parent goes, well, if they jumped off a bridge, would you do it? (laughs) Uh Uh-huh, yeah, I will, actually. Let's go. Can we find a good bridge? Please, Mom, can we? Really? We all have a little bit of a sense of knowledge, right? You're not stupid, you know? You're not going to go, well, actually, we were talking about I-25, and there's this really nice bridge over there by Nevada. Yeah. We're thinking about it, Mom. No. No, because you're not stupid. That's why when somebody says, would you fall off that bridge? The point there is, if you're not going to go do something that bizarre, don't act like you didn't want to do the thing you did do with them because obviously you did want to do it because you did it. Hear it again. Hear it again. My little girl's in the front row. All right. <clears throat> you obvious, the, the point with the bridge, you're going to be like, no, that's stupid. I would never jump off a bridge just because somebody else did it. Duh. Right. And that's the point. Because you can act like your friend made you do something If you didn't want to do it, you wouldn't do it. And that really is the point. And you can say all day long, well, I really didn't want to. Did you do it? Yeah. Then you did want to. You may not have had a huge passion about it. But again, would you go jump off a bridge if somebody else did and told you to do it too? And that, hey, look at the fun we can have. Would you do it? No way. It's bizarre. You don't want to do that. That's stupid. So you obviously know things you don't want to do. You know what you are willing to do. If you're willing to do it, then you have a level of want. No one can make somebody come to Christ. Nobody can make somebody deny themselves. Nobody can. And people make that argument all the time that it's up to somebody else. And so you know what? I don't need to worry about them. I don't need to worry about them because it's on their own head. If they don't come to Christ, see ya, I'm done. And guess what? Is that in the Bible that it's personal choice? Is it in the Bible that it's personal choice? It absolutely is. It's a personal responsibility. But a verse we read last week as part of our concept of prayer two weeks ago is from Ezekiel. And there's a little bit of a difference there. Because starting in chapter 3, verse 16 of Ezekiel, at the end of seven days, the word of the Lord came to me. Son of man, I've made you a watchman for the house of Israel. Whenever you hear a word from my mouth, you shall give them warning from me. If I say to the wicked, you shall surely die, and you give him no warning, nor speak to warn, him, to warn the wicked from his wicked way in order to save his life, that wicked person shall die for his iniquity. But his blood, I will require at your hand. But if you warn the wicked and he does not turn from his wickedness, personal choice, or from his wicked way, he shall die for his iniquity, but you will have delivered your soul. Again, if a righteous person turns from his righteousness, commits injustice, not lay a stumbling block before him, he shall die. Because you have not warned him, he shall die for his sin and his righteous deeds that he's done, that they shall not be remembered. But his blood I will require at your hand. But if you warn the righteous person not to sin, and he does not sin, he shall surely live. Because he took warning, 
and you will have delivered your soul. Guess what, guys? It's up to you to actually go out and share. It's our job. They have a personal responsibility and all that. I get that. But honestly, whatever to the personal responsibility right now. You have a job. But it doesn't just say it in Ezekiel. Because a lot of people are like, well, that's Old Testament. That's not the red letter words. I mean, when Jesus spoke out the Bible, his words came out in red print. We all see it. (laughs) Well, okay, let's check out some red print, shall we? Matthew chapter 28. Hmm, heard this before. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations. Um, He's talking to his people. And he's telling them to go to those people that apparently have the personal responsibility. Yeah, he's talking to them right here. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to to observe all all that I have commanded you, and behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. Those are your red letter words, baby. That's Jesus. He said it. So they didn't just say it back in the Old Testament. He's saying it now. He's saying, go. He didn't say, Joey, I got a cool thought for you. Now, only if it's safe do you need to go share your faith. No, he didn't say that. He said, go, period. Go do this. I don't care if it's safe, unsafe, whatever. I'm telling you, get out and go make disciples of all nations. I'm so thankful, so thankful that Moses understood his job. Because you can't get a whole lot scarier than what Moses had to do. You know what I'm saying? Brother grew up in Pharaoh's house, goes away. He comes back, not saying, hey, Pharaoh, let's chill, but saying, um, All these people that you've been making slaves, well, they're coming with me, thanks. All these people doing all your dirty work, all your jobs, all your grunt labor, uh, they're coming with me if you don't mind. We'll see you. Do you understand what he had to do? They were not an armed people. It wasn't like today's day and age where we can just fly in with a fighter jet and go, I'm swooping in, taking up my people and taking off. Moses had a staff. Now, mind you, that staff was pretty cool because when he threw it on the ground, God turned it into a snake. All right. Okay. (laughs) Pharaoh didn't have one of those. But but he didn't have an Uzi. You know what I'm saying? He didn't have some machine gun coming in there going, listen here, Pharaoh, I got some words for you, baby. (laughs) No. But what he did have was the power of God. Because, see, if God calls you out, God will go before you. And it is our job. Some of you have looked around your schools or your work or your neighborhoods, and you've gone, I can't go over there and share Jesus with them. And you think that, and we get all afraid. Why in the world are you thinking about those people anyway? Well, because I saw them, and I thought that they might need Jesus, and it started to kind of stir in my heart. But that's kind of a freaky household. You don't know what goes on over there, I'm just saying. So I can't do that. Um, I wonder if God laid that family on your heart for a reason then. Because I don't know that family. And Jeanette doesn't know that family, but Caroline, they seem to live right by you, and you're the one that noticed them. So um, just thinking out loud here, maybe that's because God wants you to reach out to them. Or you see those kids in school, and y'all know who I'm talking about. Those kids in school that your mama and daddy said, I don't want you within 100 yards of them people. (laughs) Well, I have a question about that. Got to be honorable to your mom and dad, so let me keep that there, but at the same time, i got a question for you with your mom and dad. Same question to all of you at the same time. If you noticed that person and they seemed so scary, could it be the lack of light that scares you about them? Do you understand that you have a job to do to go share your faith with them? Because if you don't go, therefore, and make disciples, that's on your head. And the sweet deal about saying that is I'm off the hook. It's scripture, not my words. He said it. But guys, because some situations are scary, I love this. In Acts chapter 1, before Jesus took off and said, see you, okay? And ascended. how cool would that have been to see Jesus ascend into heaven? But anyway, but he says this, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. And you'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Where did he just tell us to go? Go therefore into where? Go therefore into all nations. Go, therefore, everywhere. I think Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the ends of the earth apply to the word 
everywhere. True story? I mean, I know it's a little bit of math, but we can do that together, okay? Go there, to all nations. Um, that's Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, all the ends of the earth, okay? Go. And he gives you power. I love the way the message puts one little twist of a touch in there, okay? This says you'll receive power. Watch where this one kind of puts a little twist. What you'll get is the Holy Spirit, and when the Holy Spirit comes on you, you will, watch this, be able to be. Be able to be. What did the NIV just say? You will receive what? Power, right? Go back to the NIV. Okay? You will receive power, right? Go to the message. You will be able to be. Do you know why you are able to be witnesses? Because you have his power. Do you know because you have his power in you, you are able to be that witness you're called to be? But what if they reject me? Love you. <laughs> Whatever. You have a job to do. And I love how people try to snake around that. And I do mean snake around it. I love how people try to act like, no, it's somebody else's personal responsibility. It's their, if they don't want to come to Jesus, they're not going to come. To, I can't make them come to Jesus. It's all about them. It's their world, their world. I can't have anything to do with it. Jesus said, go therefore into all nations. And by the way, when you receive Jesus, if you received Jesus Christ into your life as your Savior and your Lord, do you know what he baptized you with? Baby, he baptized you with the Holy Spirit and fire. He put the, Holy, the fire in there to cleanse you out, the Holy Spirit as a promise, as a seal, which we'll get to in a little bit, to help you have that relationship and that intimacy with Jesus Christ, to help you understand God. And when you don't know what to say, to intercede on your behalf. He gave you the Holy Spirit into your life if you gave your life to Christ. Therefore, if you're walking around going, I can't because that's kind of scary, then you're not recognizing the Holy Spirit who God has promised you as a believer to do your job. By the way, it is my job to go out and evangelize and tell the world. It's your job too. If you claim the name, you have a job to do. And this is going to be a little bit of a hard hit one because most in this room are believers. Most are believers. When was the last time you went there for? To Judea, to your own little homeland, to your own little neighborhood, school, environment, and witnessed. When was the last time you went into your nation? When was the last time you went beyond? And if you don't know the answer to that, my question to you is, why don't you know? Why don't you know the answer to that? Because you really do know it. You've either done it recently or you haven't done it at all. So what's stopping you from doing your job? It's a big hit, right? It's a big hit. But see, here's the, here's the little twist. If they don't come to Christ because they don't hear the gospel, guess where they go? To hell. They die in their sins. I don't know about you, but if God points me to look at somebody and I see somebody and I think, hmm, why did God bring my attention to them? He brings it to my attention to let me know I need to share my faith with them for a reason. He doesn't put them in my face so that I can turn around and say, hmm, that's somebody that needs Jesus. Hey, Bill, can you witness to them for me? Thanks. Love you. He put them on my heart, not his. You follow? Next time you see that scary kid at school, that neighbor that's kind of a little bit odd, maybe you noticed them. Because God wants you to reach them in his name. And the next time you start to think, I can't do that. It's kind of scary. Go back and remember what Acts 1.8 says. You will receive power. It's not an arrogant power where I can run you over. It's a power that you will be able to speak. You will be able to share your faith. You will be able to do basically the job that Jesus told you to do. It's not like Jesus said, here's your job, but I'm not going to give you any tools. See ya. Good luck. 
Because go back to Acts 1.8. Go back to Acts 1.8. You'll receive the power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses. Jesus is believing in you. You will do this. You will be able to be my witnesses because of the power that I'm placing within you. I'm giving you the tool that you need. If you don't know Jesus, yes, it's your job to just figure it out yourself. It's your responsibility to really accept it. But how can you accept what you really don't know or understand? Doesn't that seem kind of weird? How can you receive a relationship with a heavenly father that you don't really know? Does that make you see what I'm saying? Because you see how confusing that can be? But you've got to go tell. But see, some people just camp out on the fact that it's all about you. And Hannah, you better be out. If you don't witness to everybody right now, well, I'm sorry. You're not going to get your good Jesus pin. You know what I'm saying? I didn't know there was a good Jesus pin, but there is now. We'll make one. Um, <laughs> but I want to throw one more little mix up with the whole personal responsibility and our job. And this mix up, by the way, is, is it your job to go tell? Is that in the Bible? Is personal responsibility for yourself, is that in the Bible though? Yeah. Here's another one in the Bible that a ton of people love to take, grab, and eat, and ignore everything we've just talked about. Okay? Because John 6, 44. Love this. No one can come to me, Jesus, my letter words, unless the Father who sent me draws him. And I'll raise him up on the last day. Hold up. Nobody can come to Jesus unless what happens? The Father draws him. So it's not my responsibility. And nor is it my job to make sure y'all people know Jesus. Because no man comes to the Father unless the Spirit draws him. So apparently it's God's alone. Apparently it's God's job alone to reach out to the people. In Romans chapter 8, and we love to turn around and go after this passage just because it's, well, it's an awesome passage. Um, and before it, we're talking about being more than conquerors, but here we go. We know in verse, cha- verse 28 of chapter 8, we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose, called according to his purpose. For those God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the likeness of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. And those he predestined, he also called. Those he called, he also justified. Those he justified, he also glorified. You guys, there's this word called predestination that people talk about. Now, some of y'all are like, predestination. Pre meaning like before. Destination meaning Determined, already set in place, all right? Okay? Before any of this, it was already set up to be. Y'all know, because I love to bring up Psalms 139, because I just think we can't hear it enough. I think teenagers can't hear it enough, but honestly, I think, I think old people obviously need to go back and remember this, too, because I think they forget themselves sometimes. You're fearfully and wonderfully made. Psalm 139 is real clear about that. Verses 13 to 16. But I love verse 16 in Psalm 139 because he says that all your days were ordained before one of them ever came to be. God set out your path before one of your days ever came to be. The problem is we all get off the path because we all want to go do our own thing. We don't want to walk his narrow road for us. You follow what I'm saying? Okay. But did he predestine us? Yeah, he did. He had all of our days ordained for us on the road that we were supposed to walk on. Mind you, we were supposed to walk on. That was his predestination. We can't say he fearfully and wonderfully made you and ordained all your days, but he didn't yours. I'm so sorry. Love you. Wrong answer. Because who forms you in your mother's womb? God. Only God can pull that stunt off. I mean, are you kidding me? Liberty organism growing into y'all. <laughs> just saying. <laughs> just saying. Really? I mean, just that constant growth that takes place is ridiculous. Only God can do that. Man has tried. 
and they mess it up every single time. You think? There's a reason for that. Man can't fearfully and wonderfully make you. Man can fearfully and wonderfully make a nice podium. But, oh well. Podium, I mean, I'm not going to kick it and it's going to say, ow. It may break. But it doesn't know. It doesn't have a soul. It's an idiot. Okay? God, fearfully and wonderfully, for everybody. God predestined everybody. And what I love is in his predestined plan, his predestined plan was to call you. His predestined plan was to say, come here to you. And then I just say, come here. It was to justify you and make you right because in your sin, you're not right. That's why he gave us Jesus Christ so that we could be justified and our sins could be forgiven and washed away. And then he didn't just want to justify you. He wanted to glorify you because guess what? You're made in his image. And because you're made in his image, he wants you to be with him and be glorified with him in heaven. Heaven's going to be a rock out party because we're all going to be right where we need to be. You know what I'm saying? We'll all be right where we need to be. But I know my life, and I'm so thankful that he justified me in spite of myself. And I'm so thankful that he continues to do a work in my life now. You follow what I'm saying? But he predestined all of us for a purpose. The book of Ephesians takes that a little bit further. And here we go. Ephesians chapter 1, starting with verse 3, and we're going to go through verse 10. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. For he chose us, he chose us in him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. And in love, he predestined, in love, he predestined us to be adopted as a son through Jesus Christ, to come in through Jesus in accordance with his pleasure and his will to the praise of the glorious grace which he has freely given us in the one he loves jesus christ in him we have redemption through the blood and forgiveness of sins in accordance with the riches of god's grace that he lavished lavished on us with all wisdom and all understanding and he made known to us the mystery of his will according to his good pleasure which he purposed in christ to be put into effect when the times have reached their fulfillment, to bring all things in heaven and on earth together under one head, even Christ. Guys, he chose us before the world to become holy and blameless for his pleasure and his will. Do you know that? He chose you. He chose all of us. But a lot of people think, no, 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 no. He didn't choose everybody. Hitler... I'm glad that I'm not the one making that judgment call. So you're saying that God didn't fearfully and wonderfully make Adolf Hitler? You're saying that God didn't have a plan for his life? I'm not saying he walked according to it. God either made a plan for all of our lives or he didn't. And if God pick and chose who he's going to have a plan for, if God pick and chose who he fearfully and wonderfully creates, who wants to be the one sitting in the corner making those calls? And by the way, what kind of God who says, let us make man in our own image? Man, which by the way entails all of us. Let us make man in our own image. What kind of God says, we're going to make man in our own image, and then he gets bored and says, eh, we'll let some of them just make themselves in whatever image they want. Wrong answer. God did it. God fearfully and wonderfully makes everybody. And then you got people that step back and say, all right, but you know what? If you're going to come to Christ, you'll come whenever God calls you so I don't have to mess with you. It's not my responsibility. And honestly, it's really not your job. You'll know. Because God will call you at that right moment if you're meant to be with God. Do you know parents do that? There are parents out there that I hear this all the time, and I think, do I slap you now or wait a little bit? But it will happen, and we will have a woodshed experience. I've had parents look at me, true story, straight to my face, and say, hey, just so you know, I don't believe it's my responsibility 
to impress my faith upon my child. They can work out their own way to Christ and to God. I just pray that they will one day. But I'm not going to push them to go to church. I'm not going to turn on and do any of that because I don't want them to resent me if they don't want my faith. I thought the scripture said, train up your child in the way that they ought to go. I'm pretty sure that's what Proverbs said. I could be wrong, but I'm pretty confident it's right. Hello? Train up a child in the way they ought to go. You're right about one thing, mom and dad. That kid will come to faith at some point. And you may be able to talk them into accepting Jesus as a five-year-old. And that five-year-old may or may not have been Jenna did when she was six. And, and I believe with all my heart because I knew the conversations that she knew what she was doing. But she also told me at four that she received Christ. And me and Lisa were real gun shy on that. Now, the cool thing is, is if she did, she did. And praise God, sweet. We just kept kind of walking with her and discipling her and listening to her speak, training her up the way she ought to go. But we wanted to make sure that if she was truly a believer, she knew what she was doing. Okay? But if she didn't do that at a young age, we'd still hang in there with her now. Do you understand what I'm saying? But as a young child, you make talk, and I've seen a lot of parents do this. They go sit their kid down and say, okay, you need to say this prayer because you just need to be with God and this is what you need to do. And so they tell their child what they need to do instead of finding out what their child believes and talking to their child about faith. The child says some random prayer and then comes back as a 14-year-old or a 13-year-old. My wife was, I believe, 12 when she did it and say, um, I don't know Jesus. I did say the little prayer. I did do all the right things. But I don't want to do the right things. I want Jesus in my life. Hello? Do you know I will never forget, and I've told this story before, but I will never forget, I was an intern at Indiana Avenue Baptist Church in Lubbock, Texas. And let me tell you, I just gotten saved when I got to college. So I was new to all that. I was growing. I was being discipled myself. I was learning. Three years in, I'm at a youth camp. And I had a young man look at me, junior in high school. And he said, David, will you pray with me to receive Christ? I'd known this kid for all three of them years. I knew his family. I mean, he'd been at church. And I was like, but the way he said it, would you pray with me to receive Christ? It was almost like, seriously, somebody help me. And I was like, well, well yeah. What's, what's the matter? What's going on? My parents won't. What? My parents won't because I said I did when I was a little kid. Well, did you talk to the pastor about it? And it wasn't our head pastor. It was the one who was kind of pastoring at that moment. Talked to the pastor about it. He won't do it either. Why not? Because he said, your parents said you already did it when you were a kid. You don't need to do it again. And I was right at him. And I said, well, let me ask you a question. Do you know that you are going to heaven when you die? No. I am not. All right. Fair enough. Is Jesus your Lord and your Savior? Have you ever come to a moment in your life where you've said, I want him to be my Lord and my Savior? Have you ever done that? No. What did you do when you were a kid? I said the prayer I was told to pray. What did you understand? That I wouldn't go to hell and I didn't want to go to a scary place, so it was all good. But you didn't understand what lordship meant. Not at all. Did you ever start to learn about lordship? Yeah, I did. And what did you think about it when you started to learn about it? I didn't care for it. I didn't want to have to obey the things that Jesus wanted me to obey. He was very articulate about the fact that he knew he was not a believer. Now, mind you, we're sealed in Christ, and I'll get there in a minute when we close. But I want you to understand something. God was calling him. He was willing to take the personal responsibility, and nobody was going. That was kind of a scary space, you know what I'm saying? So we prayed to receive Christ. That moment in time for me made me be extra cautious. Anytime ever, anybody ever came up to me to say, I don't know that I am a believer. Now I'll talk you through it, and I'll be 100%. Same thing I would with my own daughter, I would do it with you guys. Hey, when you ever you said the prayer way back, what did you think you did? Well, let's talk about it. I even think your parents ought to be in part of that conversation if they were there with you, you know? But when push comes to shove, a lot of people try to force a religion into a child, and then they do this thing. Now they can do what they want, and hopefully they'll choose faith as they keep growing up and living. 
No, 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 no. No. God chose them, and you're called to raise them. And it breaks my heart when I see kids all the time. And you know what? There's a lot of kids at your schools. I wonder how many of those friends of yours or those people that you don't even know but look kind of like freaks, I wonder how many of them have parents that say the same thing. They maybe have Christian parents that say, we'll let them choose their faith as they grow up. But we're not going to say or do anything. It's up to them. Maybe they're just waiting for somebody to be legit, for somebody to truly be a believer and actually care enough to want to invest into their life. But a lot of people say, nope, you're predestined. You're either going to be with God, Peter, or you're not. It's not up to you, and I don't have to go tell you because it's not up to me. It's not my job. And that's not right. Because if you follow the rest of Ephesians chapter 1, and you go to verse 11, I love these next couple verses. In him we were also chosen, watch me now, having been predestined according to the plan of him who works everything in conformity with the purpose of his will, in order that we who were the first to hope in Christ might be for the praise of his glory. Verse 13, Ephesians 1.13, write it down, know it, love it, own it. And you also were included in Christ when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation. Having believed, you were marked in him with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit, who is a deposit. The Holy Spirit is a deposit, guaranteeing our inheritance until the redemption of those who are God's possession to the praise of his glory. Go back to verse 13. Go back to verse 13. You're included in that predestination conversation when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation. It's meant for you. It's meant for anybody who hears it, anybody who sees it. Is it a person's responsibility to come to Christ? Absolutely. Absolutely. Is it our job to go tell? Absolutely. And is it God's call to draw them, God's own? Yeah, it's God's call to draw them. But I love, in Romans 10, man, I'm just giving you guys all kinds of scriptures. You're going to need to write these down later or something. Romans 10, 14 and 15. Love this. How then, how then can they call on the one they have not believed in? How can a non-Christian call on somebody they don't know? They don't understand him. And how can they believe in the one of whom they have not heard? And how can they hear, leave it here, without someone preaching to them? If it's a person's responsibility to come to Christ, great. They've got to have a responsibility to come to Christ. But how can they if nobody's going to go share with them? I'm going to call it what it is. If we didn't go down to Mexico, there's an older gentleman who would not have received Christ at the dedication of his house. And let me just say, that's the truth. And God set all of it up. Usually when we're at all the different houses, there's usually actually a lot of girls that are with us. This trip, for some reason, was dominant guys. Hmm, I wonder if God had a clue about that one. I wonder. Because in their culture, pretty much the women do everything. Kind of like a lot of American culture, for lack of a better way to say it sometimes too. Um, instead of the man being the spiritual leader, stepping up and owning it. And you know, the grandpa, who was the dad owner of the house that we were building for, watched us the whole time. God knew that that man needed to see godly men of all ages, teenage up, Serving, working, pouring out their lives for something that's not about them, but it's for about God in Jesus' name. That man needed to see it. And guess what? At the completion of it, he found the completion of it. Because it was not about a house being built in vain. It was about him coming to saving grace in Jesus Christ. God ordained that moment to happen. They've waited three years, and they've heard over and over and over and over, and just in case you haven't noticed, over again, that because of the media telling stories that are not quite accurate, and because of some violence that is happening there but not where they live, Christians are saying, I can't go. Well, I'm telling you this. I'm praising God that Moses heard God say, go, 
into a very dangerous situation, and Moses went. I'm praising God that Esther, who we all love to go, oh, such a woman of faith. Yeah, by the way, when she went in to see the king, she could have been killed for what she said. And she was aware. Part of why Moses, I mean, part of why Malachi told, I mean, Mordecai, part of why Mordecai told Esther, just so you know, if you don't do this, Don't think you're going to be spared, but God will find another way. Maybe God put you as one of his wives for such a time as this. It's scary. I know. But did God call you to go in, Esther? Yeah, he did. I'm so thankful she obeyed. I'm so thankful that people in our religious heritage There's several denominations that I think speak really close to the truth. It's funny, they are all different denominations, but yet they really are pretty much close to the same thing. But I'm thankful that there were people that when baptism got kind of misconstrued for something it wasn't, and people started thinking to be baptized meant just to be sprinkled on, it came from a very well-meaning motive. We talked about it in our faith class the other day, but it comes from a very well-meaning motive when Constantine got to turn around and lead his troops and they were going to conquer in the name of Jesus Christ and he didn't have time to baptize them that morning so they shook tree limbs on them and the dew on the trees fell on them and that was their baptism and in the name of Jesus with the Cairo on their shields they went out and in the peace of Christ they conquered and the world changed forever the dominant persecution that happened against Christians changed forever Hiding in little house churches changed forever on that day. But because it was so familiar, religion kept that as the form of baptism, which means to immerse for generations and centuries to follow. Oh, sprinkling, because that's what worked for us, and it made us feel good because we won the battle with sprinkling. There was a reason they sprinkled, and it wasn't because of a feel good. It was just a symbol for the moment. But I'm so thankful that there are people in our heritage that are willing to step up and say, no, man, we've got to be immersed. That's what, that's what Jesus was talking about in the Word. We've got to be immersed in Him because me being baptized, me going under that water symbolizes, man, I'm washed away. I am clean. I'm dead to myself, and I'm rising up a new creation. Hello? I get to testify my new birth, my new life. In John 3, when he's in there talking, when Jesus is in there talking to Nicodemus, and he's like, i got to be born again. What? It's talking about being born of water like the regular birth, okay? But being born again in the spirit, that's kind of that born again, I'm born again by that's that symbol of going under the water. Guys, do you know that for Baptist in the beginning, do you know how they were persecuted? They were baptized and drowned. You think you have to be immersed, huh? And that was how they were religiously persecuted. By the way, by other people who called themselves out as believers. But I'm so thankful they were willing to stand up for the truth, regardless of how scary the situation was. It would have been easy to say, Jenna, I love you, my daughter, so let's just stay quiet. We won't act like that's us. I guess it'd kind of like be the blood of the lamb on the doorpost in Moses' day, huh? Do you think... Pharaoh's troops saw the blood on their door before the final plague of taking the firstborn came through. And if you didn't have the blood of the lamb, the life would be sucked out of the firstborn. So if I paint that blood, what happens if the life isn't sucked out of the firstborn the next day, overnight? And Pharaoh's troops come through, and they see that I was a part of this. What's probably going to happen to me? They're probably going to kill me and my whole family. We don't think about that a whole lot, do we? I wonder how many of the Hebrews didn't put the blood of the lamb over their doorpost because they were too afraid of what somebody else might see and how many of them paid the price because of it. I'd be willing to take the risk if God calls and God says, because I'm called to obey. True story. Y'all, our nation needs something here. 
Our nation needs a serious awakening. And I'm not talking about America. Our nation of believers needs an awakening. We need to understand that it is our personal responsibility to follow in Christ and take up our cross daily and follow him. It's our responsibility to do it. And it's also me knowing that when I'm doing my job and going out to let them know, hey, I'm preaching so you can hear it, that if they don't receive Christ, at least I did share. I don't give up. I can't give up. Well, I already told them about Jesus, so now it's up to them. See ya. You keep showing the love of Christ to them. You have a job. Go make that disciple. Whatever it takes, make the disciple, even if it's their responsibility to do it themselves as well. Okay? But we got to know it's about God. Go to the next verse on Romans 10, verse 15. How can they preach unless they're sent? And as it's written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. God wants to call us. Our nation's got to step up and realize God's calling us. God's saying, let's rise up, people. Well, I don't have an environment where I can reach out to. Well, you better figure it out. You better figure it out. Because I don't care if you're public school, home school, Christian school, charter academy, whatever. I don't care what you are. I love you. But I don't care what your environment is. God said, go therefore. And he didn't say, go therefore one week out of the year. But he did say, I'll give you power, and you can do it here and beyond. I'm giving you power because of the Holy Spirit. Our nation needs to wake up and realize God is calling. God's doing his job. God's doing his part. He's calling us out to him. Are we going to listen and obey and take up our job? What's so crazy but so true is, y'all, every one of those elements, there are denominations that cling to It's just somebody's responsibility. I don't have to say a word. No, it's all up to me. It's all up to me to go share. Or no, it's all about God and God alone, so I don't have to do anything. And they miss the picture of who God really is. God uses his people to reach out to others. God doesn't need to, but he lets us be a part of it. I'll never forget looking at Josh and Patty after the dedication and them telling me about him receiving Christ and just looking at their expression and not just theirs, the people that were on our team that had been there and seen this man. Like a couple of them right now, I've already seen a couple of them starting to glow and it's cool because you're just like, oh yeah, oh yeah. God allows us to be a part of a life change. Kind of sad to me for those parents who think, eh, we'll see what my kid does when he grows up. God's letting you be a part of that child's life because he's letting you raise them. How sweet is that deal? I get to raise two kids. I get an opportunity to see them come to faith and to lead them in faith. I get to be a part of that. Score. And Tyler, you get to be a part of that in your own house. And not just within, you get to be a part of that within a youth ministry. God allows you. So quit hiding in the corner. Be a part so you can be a part of what God's doing. You follow, y'all? We need to wake up. Can you imagine what would happen in your schools? Can you imagine what would happen on your neighborhood streets if all the believers started following through with that? Colorado Springs wouldn't know what hit it. Wouldn't have a clue. And by the time they realized what hit them, they'd be so infested with God all over them that they would just get bigger and bigger and bigger. And then we might actually see the body of Christ becoming the body we're called to be. Because we're all doing our job, taking up our own responsibilities, but going out as well. And we're also allowing God to work in us and to speak to us. Score.